Good morning, everybody. Um, glad I could be here. I'm going to be talking about one of the performance analysis tools you can use to uh, do this analysis of, your, analysis of your software and try to learn more about the performance of your application, especially as you go to larger scales. Um, so let's see. I, uh, I work for a little company called Paratools. I don't have any academic association per se, but I work pretty closely with the University of Oregon where the Tau performance system is developed. Uh, and I'm the lead developer of the tool that I'll actually be talking about, the Tau Commander tool. So if you want to use this tool, please, let's sit together. Let's work on it. Um, I would love to, uh, to help you use this on your code on just about any machine that you have access to. OK, so I want to start with a fun little uh, mental experiment looking a little back, back in history. Uh, if you go back to 1985, the machines we had in 1985 were, by today's standards, fairly simple. Um, this is a Cray 2. It had four vector processors. And um, you know, its, power per, uh, it, its computational flops per watt was fairly ridiculous by today's standards. You know, it's, it's a very power inefficient machine. Um, but the interesting thing about this machine was that it was on I would, what I would call a, a human scale. Right? A chemist or physicist, an engineer, or somebody like that could sit down at a Cray 2 and could write a really good program that would take good advantage of the hardware. And they wouldn't have to go to extreme lengths to, to get maximum performance out of this machine. It was a, an approachable system. Um, but if you fast forward about 34 years to Aurora, what we've got now, instead of four vector processors, we have 3.2 million cores with ridiculous, you know, um, concurrent parallelism and all kinds of caching and, and um, prefetching and out of order execution. The complexity of this machine is beyond what a human brain can cope with. There is no way that out of the sheer power of your brilliance, you are going to write code that runs well on this system. You simply are not going to be able to program it without some help. Um, and, and this is a fun thing I keep running to. I've, I've been optimizing HPC codes for about 15 years now. And I keep running into engineers, chemists, physicists, computer scientists who think they've written the greatest code in the world. And then they're genuinely surprised when they plug it into a performance analysis tool. And the to tool tells them that there's a lot of room for improvement. So my point is that you really do need performance analysis tools to get maximum performance, or I would say even to get reasonable performance out of today's architectures. They are so mind-blowingly complex that you just can't go it alone, right? It's dangerous to go alone. Take this, is kind of what I'm getting at. <clears throat> Your brain sits somewhere between the 1985 machines and the machines of 2019. And you can really demonstrate this by looking at some of the results. Um, Using the tools I'm going to present today, we've been able to realize some really uh, impressive speed ups in uh, industry and government and codes, uh, research codes. And often we're, we get, you know, the people who write these codes express surprise back to us saying, wow, you, you changed just a few lines of my code and made it 30% faster, or maybe even three times faster, or 10%, or 10 times faster in some cases, uh, just by looking at the data that comes out of the tool and using that data rather than using your perception of what the, tool, what the software should have been doing. So this is, I think, was expressed very well in the previous talk, the idea that you should have expectations um, and then be prepared to be surprised when the tool contradicts those expectations. So let's take a look um, more at software performance engineering, the process of getting performance out of your code. Um, one thing I really liked in the previous talk is that, is that James em emphasized that you should have a methodology for optimization and for performance engineering. Essentially, just don't just blindly hack away at it and think, okay, well, I know where the problem is. I should just go charge dead ahead. Having a systematic, well-defined, structured approach um, will make you more productive, and it will ultimately lead to the maximum performance of, of your system. So this is a little flow chart that I came up with. This is based on my experience working with different HPC codes, uh, where the idea is you iteratively profile your code. It, it, you, you take your software, you run it through a performance analysis tool or maybe multiple performance analysis tools to identify performance hotspots in one or more of the aspects of your application. So you would look at um, file I.O. hotspots, communication hotspots, memory hotspots, or compute hotspots. And then you would apply certain optimization strategies to that hotspot until you are satisfied with the performance of that particular aspect. So 
the speed ups I've given along the sides here, 50, 10, 5, 2, these are the sort of speed ups I've seen in the real world when you focus your optimization on that aspect. That doesn't mean that, you know, compute optimization is not worth pursuing because you're only maybe going to get 2x speed up out of it um, versus 50x out of file, file I.O. The point is you should start with the slow components. File I.O. is many order magnitudes slower than your CPU. So any optimizations you realize in the file I.O. system are going to pay off orders of magnitude higher than optimizations in the CPU. Um, and I've listed a few standard uh, approaches for optimizing in, in those aspects if you want to take this back. So, so for example, you would start with file I.O., work on that a few times. You know, maybe you, you feel like you've, you've made some optimizations that are going to help. Then you want to refine your performance profile. You want to run your code through the tool again, but sort of zoom in on the performance aspect that you're working on currently. Um, to give a concrete example, if, I'm, if I, in my initial profile, see that 40% you know, of my application time is in file I.O., I want to, on the second profile, figure out exactly which file I.O. routines are expensive and what are the call paths to those routines in my code to help differentiate the different calls to the standard API. Now, one performance analysis tool that can do this is uh, Tau Commander. Tau Commander is built on a 20-year, or actually almost 25-year going project now, an academic project at University of Oregon called the Tau Performance System. Um, Tau Commander sits on top of the Tau Performance System and offers a, structure, a structured and um, methodical way to do performance engineering using the Tau Performance System as sort of the, the engine that generates the data for you. Um, Tau Commander is what I would call a, a universal tool or integrated tool because the data that it generates can be opened in many other types of performance analysis tools. This is, I think, is a really advantage over many of the uh, vendor tools that um, if you pick up a tool from NVIDIA or Intel or, or um, even some of these uh, other open source projects, there's a good chance that their data format is somehow specific to that tool. And it's difficult to get a whole picture of your performance um, you know, in, a, in an integrated way if you, if you focus on just one type of data. So it's nice to have a tool like Tau Commander that can generate um, a variety of different da data formats and, and show them in the same, um, same interface. Uh, it can give you unbiased and accurate me measurements of every aspect of your application's performance. So it can show you time spent in file I.O., time spent in on-node and between-node communication. It can show you where is memory allocated and deallocated, how much was allocated or deallocated, uh, and what are the memory access patterns uh, for, for any code region, like a, like a loop or a function. And it can show you CPU stall cycles, vectorization, instructions, uh, um, uh, cache utilization, things like um, how, how many uh, cache misses or hits at any level of the cache. And it tends to have very low overhead. Now, the way Tau achieves low overhead is by focusing on one performance aspect at a time. Unfortunately, there is no magic method for getting data without paying for it. That's just true. So if you want to minimize the overhead of profiling your application, you minimize the footprint of your tool. That is, focus on one thing at a time instead of just running in and, and turning on all the, all the options and measuring everything all at once. If you do that, your, your code will just crawl, and the data you get back will probably not even be representative or, or, or useful um, because it is so dilated by the, the overhead of the tool. So focus on one thing at a time. And then I would, I would argue that Tau Commander is easy to use. Um, speaking slightly biased because I wrote it, um, but I actually wrote this tool out of frustration with some of the existing tools. Um, I, my job was to use the Tau performance system and, and, and related tools to improve the performance of uh, various application codes, uh, CFD, Kinetics, it, it, all, all kinds of things. And um, it was taking me longer to get the tool off the ground than it was to get the code off the ground. So, I studied the tool and I came up with a way to, to make it easier to use and systematic. And um, almost three years later now, it's actually working fairly well. I don't use the Tau Performance System directly anymore. I just use this, and, and that's what most people who um, use Tau in industry tell me as well. The goal behind Tau Commander is I want the tool to configure the system, set up my experiments, um, run my application, curate my data, do all of that for me automatically. And the way to do that 
is tell the tool what your end goal is. So instead of, for example, if you were going to give directions to um, your house, you're telling your friend how to get to your house, you could say, you know, drive down Main Street 300 feet, then take a left and go 200 feet, then you know, go up Elm Street 500 feet, and, and that would probably get him there if he did every step exactly right. Um, the problem with this approach is, is it's not clear what the end goal is if you're going to go step by step by step through the tool chain. Instead, if I can state to the tool right up front, right at the beginning, that I want to get this data, it, then it acts more like a GPS. I can tell my friend, my address is this. He puts it into a tool, a GPS, and the GPS works out the route to get him to that point. So it's the same thing with Tau Commander. I tell Tau Commander, this is the kind of data I want, and this is the kind of system I'm working with, and then Tau Commander runs out, reconfigures libraries, one, you know, downloads software possibly, um, compiles things, does it all for you, and then just brings back data. So you as a scientist can focus on what is the performance data, not how is the data acquired, what are the, what are the nitty gritty of getting it. Now it's easy for me to say you know, a piece of software is intelligent and can conf configure itself automatically. That sounds like magic. So I want to go into the details of, of how this actually works um, so you can understand what it is. Again, this gets back to the idea of having a, a methodology for performance engineering. Um, the methodology I use, I call it the TAM model, T-A-M, and the idea is uh, you could really, you could do this with just about any performance analysis tool. This model is expressed, you know, it's a first class citizen in Tau Commander, it's expressed explicitly in Tau Commander, but you really could use this approach um, in VTune or Insight or Analyzer or just about any other, other performance tool out there. The idea is to construct your workflow from three fundamental components. Um, those components are the target, the application, and the measurement. And a target completely describes the hardware and software environment that you're operating in. It'll say what's the CPU architecture, what's the operating system version, um, what are your uh, compilers, your MPI libraries. And most of that data is detected automatically. Uh, any tool worth its salt can figure these, can answer those questions for you. Um, the application says, what is the application's unique features? What are the application's unique features? Such as, is it using MPI? Is it using OpenMP? Is it using CUDA? Um, is it written in C or Fortran? Is it linked statically or dynamically? Again, most of this can be worked out for you automatically based on um, a, a quick scan of the current directory, which is what Tau Commander does. And then finally, the measurement says, OK, so I've, I've got a target, I've got an application, I know, I know what my environment is, what do I want to get out of it? And the answer is, with your measurement, you can say, I want to get uh, you know, like a statistical picture of my performance using an indirect sampling measurement, or I want to use an exact measurement method to get um, really high quality data at the cost of overhead. Maybe I want to measure communication. Maybe I want to measure um, time spent on the GPU versus the CPU. That sort of um, measurement data is expressed in the measurement object. So you can define as many target application measurement objects as you like, either conceptually or directly in Tau Commander. And then selecting exactly one each of these objects forms an experiment. So that's, that's the definition of an experiment, is it's a target, an application, a measurement as a, as a tuple. If you have those three things together, it's enough information for a piece of software like Tau Commander to run out and do the performance engineering workflow for you and bring the data back. So I'll give an example of a couple um, workflows and how they're expressed in this model. If you wanted to figure out what's the best platform for my application, um, I think many of us have, have access to a variety of HPC systems or a variety of compilers or um, MPI implementations on any one HPC system. And you might discover that there's an enormous performance impact in switching compilers or switching MPI libraries or obviously in switching CPU architecture. So the question is, which one is the best for my code? Well, to figure that out, you would have uh, one measurement, which would be, say, runtime. You would have one application, which is your application, obviously. And then you would have different target ob objects that you would cycle through while holding the application and the measurement constant. This gives you a very well-defined and structured approach to uh, comparing the performance of your application across multiple targets. Now, when you use a Tau Commander, the data from each of the experiments that's formed by selecting a different target is automatically curated in a database so that at the end of the day, you can go back and see in a very clear way which of these architectures performed the best. 
Um, but you could do that manually with any tool. You could, you could just keep a system of folders and drop data into it th throughout the day, um, target zero through target in. Or what are the performance characteristics of my application on any particular system? So uh, this is fairly straightforward stuff, right? You might look at uh, file I.O., you might look at communication, memory allocation, and just change the different performance aspect that you want to measure while holding the application and the target constant. That keeps your overhead low, and it generates a complete picture of the performance of your application um, without, without really overloading the system or, or dilating the, the system too badly. Or you might say, how does any one hardware system or software system uh, perform a variety of tasks? So this is like benchmarking or, or driving a purchasing decision, right? We're trying to figure out which uh, machine does a variety of things the best. So I could, I could run different kinds of compute kernels on a, on, a, um, on a fixed measurement and a fixed target and figure out which of these you know, performs really well, which of them perform very poorly, and then I can go back and compare that um, in sort of a three-dimensional way to figure out which, of, uh, which target would be the, the best choice for a, a certain uh, set of workloads. So this is all high-level stuff. Um, what does it actually look like when you want to use the tool itself? Uh, Tau Commander is implemented in pure Python. You just put the word Tau in your path, and that's it. You don't have to compile anything. You don't have to install anything. Um, just get Tau Commander, put the Tau command in your path, and you're off to the races. To use it, put the word Tau in front of any normal command. So this could be your compilation command, like um, Tau OSHF90. It could be your um, launch command, Tau OSH run. I should have updated those commands to match Argon systems. Apology. So this would be Tau S run or Tau MPI run, um, Tau FTN if you're on a Cray system, um, Tau ICC if you're using the Intel C compiler. You get the idea. Just put the word Tau in front of everything and see what happens. <laughs> Seriously, just try it. Um, if Tau doesn't understand, if the Tau command doesn't understand what you're trying to do, it'll tell you. It'll say, you know, that's ambiguous or um, you know, you, you, you gave me some command that just doesn't make any sense. Here are suggested commands that might make more sense. Um, if it thinks it knows what you're trying to do, then it's going to go out and try to do it. One thing that happens sometimes is people do like tau ls, uh, and then what's going to happen is tau commander is going to run out, it's going to grab the tau performance system, it's going to compile it, set it up for you, run it, and it's going to give you some performance data on the ls command, right? Which might be useful, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but you, you can give it a shot. Tau Commander, um, I mentioned it's built in, in Python, which means it's completely dynamic. So the help system that's built into the tool is also dynamic. Depending on the system you go to, you're going to get different answers when you do tau dash dash help. It'll show you the defaults for that system. It'll show you the recommended set, you know, application or measurement configuration for that system, um, things like that. So if you ever get lost or, or just want a little hint, do tau dash dash help. <coughs> so, if you want to do more with the actual, actual hands-on, then let's sit together in the hands-on. Um, I would rather focus on the data and, and analyzing that data than spend a lot of time in the mechanics of the tool, because frankly, the, the typing things into a terminal is not, doesn't make for a good talk. So let's look at the data and, um, and see what sort of uh, insights you can draw from the data that comes out of Tau Commander. Um, there's two fundamental types of data sets that come out of the Tau Performance System and Tau Commander. Um, they are profiles and traces. Now, as far as I know, every, uh, pro every performance analysis tool except one uses this terminology. Um, the idea is that a profile shows how much time was spent in any, code, in any code region, but a profile does not contain any timeline data, so it cannot show you the order of events in your application. Right? I can see this bar chart, and I can see that this um, IK sweep T routine um, is quite expensive in terms of, of runtime. But I can't tell you if it was called before or after the LEQ matvec routine. That, that information is not available in the profile. Now, by and large, you don't need that information. For one thing, you typically have the source code, so it's kind of easy to see which was called first. Um, but what if you wanted to see the order of events for, say, sending and receiving messages between different compute nodes? For that, you will need to use a trace. A trace holds all the same data as a profile, except it also includes timeline data. So you can get exactly the same information 
from a trace that you can get from a profile. But because the timeline is included and every event is timestamped, the size of a trace is dependent on the length of your run, time, of your run so that it's going to grow and grow and grow as you, as you go. Um, and it's also going to contain far more data. A typical profile is order, you know, maybe a few kilobytes or a few megabytes. I've never seen a profile exceed like a gigabyte. Even on an enormous system with many thousands of cores, it never gets that large. Traces are routinely orders of gigabytes and even terabytes. A short run will easily give you, you know, 50 gigabytes of trace data. So you should understand why you need each kind of data and you should understand when you need to get it. Basically, go with profiles all the time unless you need to see the order of events, then get a trace. Within profiles, there's different types of, of profiles, different grades of the data you can get. Um, most profiles are flat, meaning they just show you the time in each code region. They don't show you where the code region was called on the code. Um, they don't show you, or, you know, any kind of uh, context for the, the function call. You just see that you know, this much time was spent in this much function, or this much time was spent in this, much, this loop of body, and that's it. Um, Tau Commander goes one step beyond that, and it automatically generates call path profiles by default. That means that you will, you will see an event for the function or the loop body, but you'll also see an event for the call path that led to it. The previous talk mentioned this, right? If you have a common, uh, a, a common API routine that's called all over the place, then it's sometimes very difficult to figure out um, why it's expensive. You need to figure out the, the you need to find the, the call to that common routine on a particular call path so that you can see the particular arguments going into that function and, the, and, and that will tell you why it's expensive or, or give you context to why you know, it's taking so long, especially if it's some sort of communication or synchronization routine. You really need the call path event. Phase profiles are just sort of an extension of call path profiles um, that break the runtime of your whole application into various phases. So this would say, uh, imagine you have, a, you have a function called like send data and you call send data during the initialization, um, during the iterization, you know, during pro uh, program iteration, and then you also call send data during finalization. If you want to separate the time spent in, in send data between those three phases, you use a phase profile, and you'll get three different counters for that same code region so that you can easily figure out, you know, was send data taking a lot of time in, in initialization, or was it really just not that expensive and it goes quick, quite quickly in the, in the iterative phase? So it comes down to how much data do you want? You have to think about which uh, data type should, or which, uh, yeah, what data type I should use and, um, and why. Now, I've highlighted the defaults here. If you pick up Tau Commander and you just throw it at a piece of code, um, you're going to get a flat profile. That's your default, or sorry, uh, you're going to get a call path profile actually by default. This flat profile should. I should have highlighted the other one. You're actually going to get a call path profile by default, which is an order, you know, megabyte maybe of data, even for a very long running application. Uh, if you switch to tracing mode, you're looking at gigabytes, terabytes, um, and it's going to keep growing as your code runs. Typically, when I'm working on this, when I'm iterating through and refining my profile, in my first pass, I use the call path profile to get a high level look at what's, you know, where, where things are spending time. And then I uh, zoom in on one particular region, and I might, if it, there's a lot of communication in that region, I might decide to activate tracing for just a short period of the runtime in that code region. So then I get a call path profile with a trace that covers a short period of time, and I can see the order of events in that uh, window. Um, so within profiling and tracing, there's, there's two different ways to get the profiles and the traces. Um, you can measure the data directly, which will give you exact measurement of the, of the performance statistics. You will know precisely how, mi how much time, precisely how many stall cycles, precisely how many vector instructions in a code region. The challenge for a direct measurement is that uh, you, you are going to pay a little bit more in overhead. And if, you, if you're uh, careful, it's not going to be too much. It's you know, 3 to 5% if you do it well. And the other challenge is that you've actually modified the code, right? You've inserted calls to some sort of API into your application. Um, this can have a, a number of side effects, everything from changing the performance of the code to revealing bugs that you didn't realize. This is actually at, at uh, this, this same workshop last year. 
sat with a guy during the hands-on, and we worked together for about 90 minutes before we realized that his code was, was buggy and that the bug had only been revealed by inserting these probes back into his code. So he had to go and fix his bugs before he could even get the performance. That might be good or bad, right? <laughs> we found the bug, but it was painful. Um, now, a much easier way to get data is to use an indirect method uh, where you periodically sample the application, look at what it's doing, and then build a statistical picture of its performance. This is the default measurement method in Tau Commander. By default, you're gonna get sampling because it's always the shortest path to data. It's gonna show you a pretty good idea of where things are spending time. And that's enough for your first pass before you wanna refine your profile and zoom in and decide if you need direct measurement. Let's assume we were able to get some data out of the code um, by putting tau in front of everything. That's how it works. Put tau in front of your compiler command, put tau in front of your run command, um, and then at the end of the day, you type the word tau show. show the show subcommand will just bring up the data from the last uh, experiment. So we are doing tau show. We get some performance data. And uh, typically, you'll get something that looks like this. The, the first thing you'll see is a bar chart, and it'll show you how much time was spent in each code region. This uh, is a good way to focus your optimization efforts because in just about every piece of software under the sun, uh, the performance profile follows a Pareto distribution, meaning there's about 95% of the, of the activity is occurring in about 5% of the source code. There's always gonna be this heavily you know, sloped um, bias towards about you know, maybe five, 10 routines in the code. I can't think of an application I've seen where, the, where I open this bar chart and it's just, you know, everybody has the same performance. It's always two or three routines that um, are very time expensive. So those will highlight at a glance where you should be focusing your optimization efforts because that's where the payoff is large. If I can cut time spent in MPI all to all by half, then I've saved, you know, 48 seconds or so. I could cut band LU solve in half and I've only saved 0.6 seconds. So it tells you where to focus your optimization. Tau will also show you how many instructions in every code region, or even more importantly, perhaps, how many stalls occurred in a code region. So this is fun because I can see um, in the previous chart, MPI all to all is a very time expensive routine, but if I look at the number of floating point instructions, MPI all to all has vanished entirely, which makes sense, right? All to all is a communication call where every uh, a participating MPI rank sends a different message to every other rank. It shouldn't be doing any floating point math in there. Uh, in fact, uh, if I saw a high floating point instruction count for all to all, I'd be very suspicious. Something is very wrong. Um, instead, I see that my FFT routine is right at the top, which makes perfect sense, right? Fast Fourier transform should be doing a lot of floating point math. <clears throat> the second most expensive floating point reg region here is the banded LU decomposition. Um, followed by some, some, uh, some uh, uh, utility functions for the, for the FFTs. I can also look at cache misses in L1, L2, L3, um, and then the more exotic architectures with, uh, with things like high bandwidth memory, um, like the KNL, you can look at um, memory that's allocated in high bandwidth memory versus in DRAM and try to um, work out what are the memory access patterns in those two um, memory subsystems. Now, MPI all to all, you'll notice, is back on the list, right? It's now the second highest score in here because, well, that makes sense. You're not gonna be able to cache an operation that fundamentally sends a different message to every other process in the system. So it makes sense to see it at the top of the list. But it's interesting that my FFT is also scoring very poorly in, the, in cache misses. Now, I'm not showing stall cycles. You know, that would be the thing to look at. Check out, is it actually stalling um, or do these, you know, are these, are these cache misses things I need to worry about? But it is a little worrisome that an FFT would be missing um, in, in cache so much. Um, there might be a performance hotspot I should examine. You can look at how much memory does the code use? Uh, what is the memory high watermark? This was very relevant on the blue gene architectures and, and it still will be until, the, until um, Mira and Vesta uh, are, retire. But on a low memory architecture like blue gene, knowing your high memory mark uh, determines how many uh, MPI ranks per node you can actually allocate because you have to share the memory between multiple uh, processes. I can see total allocated and deallocated statistics and exactly where in the call tree memory is allocated or deallocated. 
This is kind of a fun call tree because this is a code that uses a Python wrapper to invoke Fortran. What I'm demonstrating is that Tau Commander can work on combinations of multiple different languages, even if they're compiled and interpreted. So I can see in the call stack that um, some sort of function called rmain, which is actually a Python function, is ultimately calling something called static CFD, which is, well, that was actually a C++ function, and static CFD ultimately calls something which is CFD in all caps, which is a Fortran function. I can see the memory allocation across all those languages, and I can see how those allocations will interact. If you allocate memory in C++, pass it through the Python wrapper down to the Fortran code, um, that will appear in the profile. <clears throat> you can see the I.O. characteristics of the application. And I mentioned, you know, 50x speedup in, in optimizing the I.O. Is, is not uncommon. I.O. is so horribly slow that anything you do there is likely to pay off in a big way. So um, file I.O. and especially parallel file I.O. Uh, are important aspects to consider in your profile. Uh, MPI I.O., you can see, for example, peak write bandwidth. And then collectives. If you want to scale out to 3.2 million cores on Aurora, you're going to have to pay attention to synchronization points, things like barriers, all-to-all um, -all calls, um, reductions, anything that involves everybody talking to everybody else or a large number of cores talking to one core. Um, these things uh, naturally lead to, bot to bottlenecks in your code. And um, being aware of them in the profiles is usually the first step to improving the scalability of your application overall. Uh, Tau Commander's profile visualizer is called Paraprof. Paraprof has a very nice 3D uh, viewer for profile data that um, I use this a lot because you can see at a glance any patterns in the profile data. For example, I can see right away that there's an inverse pro, uh, relationship in the time spent in this routine up front. Oh, where's my laser? There it is. This routine, sort of a Golden Gate Bridge looking thing, and this one, right? These, there's clearly some sort of inverse relationship between these two functions. There might be something I can do to improve the performance of the application there. Um, I can also see that this is a hot spot in the back, and that this is a hot spot, but it's also very jagged meaning that this, this routine is uh, working hard, but there's a lot of load imbalance in that routine across the different uh, MPI ranks. So just by glancing at this, this graph, you can make a lot of, uh, you, can, you can reason about the data in a way that is very difficult if you look at uh, just a 2D chart or, or histogram. You do the same thing with the communication matrix. This is showing time in, in code regions, right? Times in functions. But what if I want to see time spent communicating between different nodes? Then I can visualize the communication matrix, which is just uh, senders versus receivers. And then the height could be any metric you like. Could be number of calls. Could be um, compute, uh, or, or, uh, communication um, volume in bytes, uh, whatever you like. This is a good way to see if there's hot spots of communication in your system, if maybe you've balanced the load and in, inefficiently or if there's a, a bottleneck, everybody wants to talk to you know, rank zero too much, something like that. You can also look at the topology, both virtual and physical. This is a fun thing to try. Um, we're, we're trying to implement this, well, actually trying to implement, we are implementing uh, topology visualization for Cray XC40 and some of the newer Crays that will show you in physical space the actual racks of the machine, and you can see where your, your processes are running um, in those racks. And then that's a great way to see you know, if, if your code is slow because of a system level issue. Maybe there's a heating issue in a rack or something. And you realize every time a, a rank goes on this, this particular node, it just slows down. Um, and there's nothing in the software you can do about that. That's time to call the sysadmin. That's, this is a true story. That actually has happened to me. And finally, um, as you're using this tool, you're generating data, you're iteratively refining your profile, you're going to keep um, inserting data into a database. Tau Commander will do that for you automatically, or with other tools, you could build this database yourself. And then, at the end of the day, you can look at how is your application scaling. This is an example of um, a runtime breakdown chart. It's a little dated now, it's Jaguar. Um, but it, it demonstrates quite nicely, I think, that when you scale out the number of processors, things start to behave in a strange way. Uh, in this case, we saw that the MPI wait all call started to become a significant fraction of the overall runtime 
when we reached over 12,000 cores of Jaguar. Uh, and this was because we were spending a lot of time in this routine write save file. Essentially, it was using a serial I.O. Uh, scheme so that everybody would send their data to one process and the one process would dump the checkpoint file. And uh, by changing that to a parallel I.O. scheme, we improved scalability dramatically by reducing the time in MPI wait all and write save file. Um, another way to look at the data, you, can, you don't have to look at the data um, where it's all scaled. You can look at the data in, in a raw way to, to see, you know, if, um, for example, I can't see from this chart if the 1,200 uh, or the 12,000 core run was actually faster or slower than the 1,000 core run. But if you look at the bar chart, you can see if, if that is the case. You can also look at what events correlate with runtime. This is a, a chart. You just open the um, Perf Explorer tool, and there's a button you, you select uh, you know, a button you click that says, you know, correlate events with runtime, and this chart will come up. This will show you if there are trends across different code regions that might be related to a deeper system issue, like, um, you know, for particular core counts, maybe your MPI implementation is not very effective, something like that. Everything I've shown you up to this point is profile data, right? And I want to, uh, to emphasize that. This is, these are the kilobyte, megabyte sized data sets. So they're very small and they're still very powerful. You can see that you get a lot of information out of a profile. If you want to go to a trace, um, there's some great visualiz visualizers out there. Uh, Vampire is probably the best uh, trace visualization tool. Uh, I think a talk later in the day is going to introduce ScorePy P and Van Vampire. Those are, are excellent tools for um, trace analysis. Tau Commander can generate uh, traces that can be viewed in Vampire natively. So if you select tracing in Tau Commander, then you will get data that can be opened directly in Scorpio or Vampire. And those tools all interrupt um, perfectly, I would say. So here's an example of a, a trace I took um, on Cori using just 64 nodes, but you could go as high as you like. And I can see the communication matrix, I can see the call tree, I can see um, time spent in code regions across all ranks. And you can zoom in on this trace. This is showing sort of the boundary between the two compute nodes. And I can see that across the two compute nodes, there's very different timelines, right? They have uh, an offset in their clock right at the beginning such that there, there will be lost time when they communicate. That is you know, a fundamental property of distributed memory architectures. That's just what you deal with. But you can see it very nicely in the profile. Zoom in far enough, and you can actually see individual sends and receives between the, between the nodes. This is a good way to look for um, a load imbalance where everybody you know, posts that they're ready to receive data, and then one guy is taking so long to pin his, comp his computation that he doesn't actually send his data to everyone else um, you know, until, until well in the future, and there's been a lot of lost time. That'll show up very dramatically in a, in a trace, especially in a tool like Vampire. Um, you can see using call sites where the events occur. This is a bit like the call path profile. So call path profile will generate a different event for each call path. A call site will show you the source code line um, and uh, file name for a particular API call, right? If I, if I want to see where um, my MPI send was, in, was invoked, I can turn on call site profiling, and then I'll, I'll, I won't just see MPI send. I'll see MPI send at you know, ISX.C line 437. Um, that's a great way, especially in a trace, to figure out which calls to the standard API are especially expensive. Um, I'm running low on time, so I'm going to skip over this. Tau Commander does include some fundamental debugging features. Tau is not a debugger, but it is handy because it has all this instrumentation already built into the system. Um, you, you will probably uncover some bugs while you're doing your profiling. So it's nice to have a tool that can unwind the call stack, show you your application source code, and point to the problem, right? Like here I've injected an obvious division by zero problem. So you, um, you have these built into Tau Commander in case you want them, but I've run out of time, so I'm not going to discuss them now. Uh, we could definitely look at that in the hands-on. If you want to try Tau Commander, please go to taucommander.com, give it a shot. Tau Commander is, op is openly developed, I would say. If you go to the GitHub page, you can see current issues, releases, uh, everything is out there. Uh, we test nightly on Travis, we use CodeCov, you know, the whole thing is there. And uh, this has been really beneficial, I think, because we've had a lot of feedback from users, um, industry and government users, who, who just post issues, and then we go fix them. It's been a very great way to develop the tool. I, I ask, encourage you, if you try Tau Commander and something breaks, 
just go post a GitHub issue, and um, I'll probably respond within you know a, a, a month or so, something like that. So I want to thank everybody. Thank you again, Argon, um, for having me here. And somebody once said the only reason to have an acknowledgement slide was to tell when people to clap. So please clap. <laughs> I think I used every minute. Oh, okay, great. Any questions? Yes. I noticed on one of your slides that you uh, had a comment that static analysis is part of Tau Commander. Um, is that true, or, or um, what features do you have? Static linking, probably. So we support statically linked binaries. Um, it does have some static analysis features in that it has a source code parser that will automatically insert the performance hooks into your code, but it can't you know, parse your source code and say how much memory will be allocated or something like that. There was another question. Yes. Uh, so, do you know PHPC or are you um, familiar with PHPC Toolkit? Am I familiar with HPC Toolkit? Absolutely, yeah. Mellicrum's group. The follow up question is um, from my understanding, is it like the functionality is very similar, just that the Tau Commander um, basically is able to do the experiments with a different configuration, but from the uh, from the results you get and from the methodology that you just analyze um, your uh, application without actually modifying it, um, it's very similar. Yes, yes. So to, to summarize, that it was more of a statement than a question. But the fact that Tau Commander and HPC Toolkit are very similar, um, they both use uh, sampling. They both uh, generate data based on experiments. HPC Toolkit is a, is a good tool. Um, and it's always a good idea probably to use one or two, two performance analysis tools, especially when you're just starting out, to sort of sanity check each other, right? You want to make sure that the tools aren't lying to you and that you understand the data that comes out of the tool. So um, yeah, try HPC Toolkit. It'll, it will use the same measurement methods, and then you can compare the data coming out of that tool, the data coming out of Tau Commander, um, and see which one is a little easier to understand. Yes? Uh, on the GitHub page, it looks like there's some things you only get with a paid subscription. Uh, so, can you talk about that? Also? Yes, Tau Commander is developed um, under SBIR from Department of Energy. So that means we've been we've been given money by Department of Energy to develop this this tool. A follow-on project is a thing called Tau Enterprise, which is a cloud-based um, data analysis service. Tau Commander is completely free, open source, BSD license. There is no part of Tau Commander that requires money. Or, or any kind of license, not even GPL license, right? Legally, you could steal this thing, rename it Joe's Cool Profiler, and run with it. Um, I don't recommend you do that because you probably don't know what the tool does, but, um, <laughs> but you, you could legally do it. Tau Enterprise is a closed source effort that we're developing currently, and it will um, do a lot of the data analysis for you automatically. Right now, it's up to you to get the data and to understand it. Enterprise will tell you, you know, there is a hotspot in MPI weight all, and it is caused by load imbalance in function foo. Right now, you'd have to rely on your own expertise to get that out of Tau Commander. I'm glad somebody's on the GitHub. That's cool. <laughs>